Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at Bethlehem. Will you stand? Sing with us as we rejoice in the mercies of our King together. Wonderful of fear, come behold his power and glory, yet with confidence draw near. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your he is worthy of all praise. Rejoice. Sing the mercies of your King. And with trembling, rejoice. Sing, we are children. We are children of the promise, the beloved of the Lord. One with everlasting kindness, bought with sacrificial blood. Bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know the affections of a father who will never let them go. All our sorrows, Jesus carried up the hill. He has walked this path before us. He is walking with us still. Turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed. You cry to him, he hears your voice. He will wipe away your tears. Rejoice in the midst of suffering. He will help you sing. Rejoice. Come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy. Oh God, you are infinite in your power, you are infinite in your holiness. None can come before your presence and live because of our sin. So how is it that we can sing this morning to rejoice? For we do gather in your name and we do call upon you to be with us and to come inhabit this place with your glory. How can it be that we can say rejoice and not run? Because the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us from all unrighteousness and caused us to be presentable to the holy God. Righteousness, our sin for his righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So we come this morning, our, our claim is not our own righteousness but the righteousness of Christ, the Son in whom you are well pleased, and we are in him, and therefore you love us. 
and dwell among us. So we do rejoice. Re rejoice for the gospel truth this morning and come boldly into your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. Welcome to worship with us this morning. We're so glad that you've joined us. Uh, we welcome you, whether this is your first time or your many, many, many nth time. Um, a special welcome to our visitors and particularly a welcome to uh, the families of our candidates for baptism this morning. As you can see, this isn't our, my normal Sunday morning in case this is your first visit with us. But we're celebrating the work of God in the gospel to call a people to himself and we just, just displayed in baptism. And so a special welcome to the families that are here. We're so privileged to have you join us. A few announcements uh, for the congregation. Um, one is that today is the day to bring back your food bags for the Jericho Road food drive um, and for the Minnesota Food Share Initiative. So today's the day. Secondly, uh, to all the men of Bethlehem, uh, on April 6th at 8 a.m., there'll be a men's gathering and um, just putting, putting that announcement out there so you can start getting ready. And um, I believe it'd be helpful to register. So if you can go to the website or the app, you can find more information and be prepared for that. Um, so, and then also our global partner of the week is April Campbell, who's ministering in Costa Rica. And um, just a Really amazing, many years of faithfulness there. And our prayer focus for the week is, is the, are the people of Costa Rica and the, the needs. And the, this is one of those places in the world, some places are just, the gospel is just dry, no gospel presence. Other places where there's a lot of gospel vibrancy happening and conversion and growth. And other places where there's, there's a scent to the, to the gospel, to Jesus, and yet, it seems cold and distant. And so there's lots of needs and uh, around the world and Costa Rica is one of the many of the whole world and the whole world of needs. And so um, we'll, we'll be, I'll pray for them in a moment, but back to baptism. Uh, so this morning we have five young men who are here to, to be baptized. And just to remind you, and, and we don't assume that everyone has ever seen, witnessed this. And so we, we want to, to explain that baptism is an outward expression of an inward reality. The inward reality being that one who has been, who is separated from God because of their sin, with no hope in their own works. In fact, their own works adding to their condemnation. That's a hard thing to hear, especially for Americans in the 21st century. But it's an important message. Our good works that seek to cause us to be acceptable in God's sight do not save us. They're not neutral. They actually add to our condemnation. For God is so holy that there is no way for us to do good things to be acceptable before him. But he's made a way through his son Jesus, who has paid the penalty for the sins of his people. And he's done that by shedding his blood, by giving his life. So these um, robes that we wear that are red, they depict the blood of Jesus that covers us so that we can be acceptable to God. And then as, we, as the, the baptism candidates go under the water and out of the, come out of the water, it represents our, our being united with Christ in his death and his burial and then in his resurrection to new life. We are new creatures in him born again to a new and living hope, forever and ever and ever and ever acceptable to God as his children. And so, um, of course, this is a little bit, uh, this is pretty exciting to me as uh, the guy who does the college ministry here. And, the, and it's the, the, the joy is to help support our staff. And so these guys are all students that are involved in, in campus outreach and connected to Bethlehem. And so we thought it would be appropriate just to hear from the staff guy, one of our, another staff guy who um, disciples several of these, several of these students. And so Billy Core is our, is our campus director at the, at the University of St. Thomas. And he's just gonna share for a, a minute and, and help us <laughs> only two minutes or less. Uh, both Bill and I have the same blessing slash disease, which is we always got lots to say anytime to anybody. So, uh, but come on, Billy. Hello, everyone. 
Uh, my name is Billy. I am on staff with Campus Arch Minneapolis. I think back there, if you've ever seen us, my wife is back there with our three little ones. So if you see three little mixed kids, that's our kids. They're really, really cute. Uh, I have the privilege of being able to spend time with college students at St. Thomas and seeing them come from death to life. And I'm sharing today because part of the beauty of what's happening right here in a little bit is God has individually saved these people and even some of these people over here. Uh, yeah, you can look up. I'll point you back up there in a little bit. And what he's done is individually saved these people and then not only have they, has he saved them, he saved them into a new family, a community. And it's been beautiful to watch and it's been a privilege to be a part of. Five years ago, I stepped on that campus and I was playing basketball, I was having Bible studies, and students were drinking during these Bible studies. And then fast forward, look at what he's done. Look. Okay, look, look, look up there. Look over here. Look behind you. And, and uh, uh, I'm losing my train of thought now because it's something to celebrate. And uh, so celebrate with us what God is doing on the college campus. And I hope that you would also be inspired to dream about what could God do through you in your workplace and in your neighborhoods. Amen. So let's, let's pray. God, we, we praise you as the, as the creator of all things. We praise you as the creator of, our, of ourselves. You've, and you've created us in your image. There's no, nothing else in creation that, uh, that, that can be said. Um, the, even the angels, when they look at salvation, they long they long for it, and it's not theirs. Even the glorious angelic beings, only people created in your, in your image are saved by grace through faith in Jesus and the power of the gospel. And so we praise you and thank you for to be able to gather in your name and to worship you and to do so with joy, even trembling, but with awestruck joy, something that the world knows does not know about. And so... Uh, we, and we praise you for this, this gathering, this church, one, one little representation of your universal church around the world. And, and we do pray for April. We thank you for her ministry. We pray that you will protect her, provide for her, sustain her, and that through her life and words, the gospel of Jesus Christ would go forth and people would hear and by your grace receive and be born again and, and repent and believe and trust in you forever. We pray for the country of Costa Rica and the countries of the world and all of our global partners and all of the, par the partnership we have with all who seek to preach the true gospel from the, from the word of God, that you would advance your kingdom and that, and that you would glorify yourself. And now as we, as we look to uh, exercise this wonderful testimony, display of your power and grace, we pray that that you would work in and among us to advance the gospel and bring glory to your son by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Growing up with two parents who loved Jesus meant that I knew that I needed the gospel from a young age, and I accepted Jesus into my heart when I was in elementary school. But as I got older, I began to turn to my own strengths and abilities for satisfaction and purpose. I neglected to read God's word continually because I didn't think that there was anything more I needed to learn from it as I had grown up in the church. I started keeping Jesus at arm's length as I grew. And in high school, I began to put my identity in my academic performance and my social standing. I believed that these things would fulfill me ultimately. And I doubted in the long run that Jesus knew what was best for my life. God began to work more dramatically in my heart uh, when I began at the University of Minnesota. Here I joined campus outreach and met several staff and many good friends who challenged and encouraged me in my faith. God worked in my heart during this time to humble me towards him. And during this time, he took things away that I had been leaning on in my life and showed me that I could ultimately trust in him. He gave me a new desire to read and study God's word, which opened my eyes to the truth and beauty of the gospel in a way that I had not experienced before. Even after spending years of my life living for my own success and glory, God was faithful to humble me in repentance towards him, faithful to forgive me of my sins and give me a new heart and a new understanding of the world in which I can trust freely in him and his plans for my life. I can now live according to the truth that 
My life is based on the work that Jesus Christ has done on the cross and not anything that I can do. I would like to be baptized to share the good work that God has done in my life and to obey Christ's command in the Bible. So Matthew, are you now trusting in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of all of your sins and the fulfillment of all his promises to you, including eternal life? I am. And do you reject Satan and all his works and all his ways? I do. Is it, is it your intention to obey Jesus' commands and follow him as your Lord by his grace? It is. So Matthew, based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ alone as your Lord and Savior and treasure, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My life before Jesus was very empty and unfulfilling. I, um, I made idols out of things like relationships, um, making money, um, and just in general worldly things. Um, I tried to pave my own path, um, and I was consumed by thinking about the future, and ultimately it left me with no hope for anything. After meeting Jesus, my life has um, done a complete 180. I found a hope in Jesus and all of his glory. I um, was able to um, meet the community around me, and they have spurred me on. Um, the community at St. Thomas has been really helpful in my walk with Jesus. Um, the guys and gals that I've met, have really impacted me um, and led me to a stronger relationship with Jesus. Um, one verse that really sticks out to me is 2 Corinthians 4, 18. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So I want to be baptized because um, I'm commanded to be baptized. And also, I want to be baptized because I want to unite myself with God and with my brothers and sisters around me. So, Lincoln, are you now trusting in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of all of your sins and the fulfillment of all God's promises to you, even eternal life? I am. And do you reject Satan and all his works and ways? I do. And is it your intention, by God's grace, to obey Jesus' commands and follow him as your Lord? It is. So, Lincoln, based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ alone as your Lord and Savior and treasure, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My life was um, pretty empty. I uh, found my identity in a lot of worldly things. I um, pursued everything under the sun. I wanted to make a lot of money. I wanted to uh, be, have a better version of myself. I wanted to um, pursue these things that deep down just were not um, satisfying me. Um, before Christ, I was um, in pretty dark places mentally. And I felt like I couldn't get out of this, um, this root that I tried so hard to get out of. Now that I know Jesus, my life has been completely transformed. I have this eternal vision. Um, I want to share the gospel with people. I have a, a new heart that loves people for who they are. I understand that the gospel is the best thing for any singular person. And there are so many people that don't know who Jesus is. And I want to be um, a means for God sharing the gospel with others. I want to be baptized because God has completely transformed my life. Um, this is a public declaration of my faith in Jesus. And he has completely changed me and who I am and how I live my life and how I am going to live my life. And I think that this can be very um, helpful for someone in investigating who Jesus is um, and ultimately pursuing a relationship with him. So Cole, are you now trusting in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of all of your sins and the fulfillment of all his promises to you, 
including eternal life. I am. And you reject Satan and all his works and all his ways. I do. And by God's grace, is it your intention to obey Jesus' Jesus's commands and follow him as your Lord? It is. So Cole, based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and treasure, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, before Christ, um, I kind of just felt like I was going through life and nothing was really that bad. And I always felt like there was something missing. At the start of my senior year in high school, I was going to work and I got in a car crash in my neighborhood. I hit a parked car, a real intelligent move by me. And I think in that moment, in the accident, um, I just got kind of got like into a shock and it kind of hit me that one day I'm gonna die. It was something about the sound of the brakes screeching. That sound really jump-started my faith journey, and it led me to dig deeper into the Bible and learn more about what the gospel was. When I started going to the University of St. Thomas, I met this guy named Billy Corr, and since that first week of freshman year, we uh, met up every week. And honestly, we just kind of started off slow and kind of just got to know each other, and since then, um, our conversations have taken off, and he's really been an impactful piece of my faith and growing closer to God and finding more joy in God. Along with Billy, my roommates, Cole and Lincoln, have been an integral part of my faith. And it's just fun late at night, getting into deep conversations once we're all done with homework. Uh, maybe after we beat them in Madden, we just get really deep randomly and go off on these tangents. And it's just really fun doing life with those guys as fellow brothers in Christ. I want to be baptized because I want to publicly declare uh, what Jesus has internally done to me in my heart in saving me from all my sin. And I want to publicly declare Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Amen. So, Patch, are you not trusting in Jesus Christ alone? I am. Good. <laughs> For the forgiveness of your sins and, the, and all of his promises to you, including eternal life. I am. Oh, that's a double. That's awesome. And do you reject Satan and all his works and all his ways? I do. And by God's grace, is it your intention to obey Jesus' commands and follow him as your Lord? Yes. So, Patch, based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and treasure, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, before I was a Christian, um, I was living for myself, and I feel like, um, in a sense, football for me was a huge idol, and that was essentially my God. Um, and I just, it was a struggle for me because so much of my life was based on how I performed on the field. Um, and I feel like it was hard sometimes to be close to me because if I had a bad game, or, um, you know, if the game wasn't, if we lost the game, um, you know, I was a hard person to be around. Um, and it was just, uh, my life was really just uh, full of ups and downs. So I became a Christian last spring. And since then, the Lord has completely changed my desires. And, um, you know, I... I can just see myself doing so many things where the old me just wouldn't even think about doing. I want to be baptized because I feel like it is a outward expression of just the change that has occurred in my life um, and we're commanded to do so. Baptism can be encouraging for a lot of people. And yeah, um, if I can in any way encourage non-believer or even a, a believer um, to continue to walk um, and further their relationship with Christ, um, I don't see why I wouldn't want to take that opportunity. So Gus, are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of all of your sins and the fulfillment of all his promises to you, including eternal life? Yes. And you reject Satan and all his works and all his ways? Yep. And by God's grace, is it your intention to obey Jesus' commands and follow him as your Lord. Absolutely. So, Gus, based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ alone as your Lord and Savior and treasure, 
And in obedience to his command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Let's read together the words of the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless altogether. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Amen. What wonder of wonders, what love is this, that Christ would die for me. His goodness, his merit, his righteousness, the sinner's only plea. O oh, foolish might be crucified, the work is finished. All my boast is in Jesus, all my hope is His love, and I will glory forever in what the cross has done. Now fully forgiven, my life is filled.
Amen, O oh Lord. May it never be that we should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning we set our eyes on Christ and on his cross, and we rejoice in thanksgiving at the wonder of wonders there. We glory in what the cross has done. And like a pearl or like a diamond, we love to turn this gospel about every which way and admire it from every lovely angle. So we thank you, God, that at the cross you have forgiven our great sin against you, laying it on your Son. We rejoice that we have been united so deeply with Christ that now his merit, his righteousness, is counted as our own. We glory in the cross where our old self was crucified, the power of sin broken over us. And now by your Spirit, we can love you, live for you, and enjoy you. We thank you that now fully forgiven, our lives are filled with graces undeserved. Every good blessing in our lives and everything bad that you turn for good was purchased for us at the cost of the death of your son. Thank you. And perhaps most sweetly, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The hope purchased for us on the cross of being united with our God one day in glory and fellowship. So yes, all our boast is in Jesus. May Christ be exalted in the hearts of his people in Bethlehem. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. So at this time, we announce our offering. There are ways on the screen behind me to give electronically. There are also boxes in the back if you'd like to give as you leave. The Lord said, The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Would you consider if the Lord would have you give back the earthly riches he has given you to support the cause of the kingdom of heaven advancing through the church? With that, let's continue singing of our treasure. I will glory in my Redeemer, whose priceless blood has ransomed me. Mine was the sin that drove the bitter nails and hung him on the judgment tree.
may be seated. Let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are our rock and our redeemer, and we glory, we delight in you. We have come before you together now in prayer at your invitation, called by your Spirit, clothed in Christ, and we do rejoice in you. We delight in you, for you are a great God. You, Lord, are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You are good to all. Your mercy is over everything you have made. You are faithful in all your words and kind in all your works. You, O oh Lord, hold all who are falling and raise up all who are bowed down. And so we pray for, it seems like so many among us who are bowed low in these days, suffering in these days, either with illness or circumstances that have brought them low. We pray particularly for just a number of our global partners and those preparing to go on the field that have God, in your providence, you have brought difficulty, pain, suffering, turmoil in their lives. And yet in that, you are showing your grace and your mercy. And so we thank you for it. And we ask, as they are being bowed down, that you would raise them up. That all this would not be for Nothing, but it would be for the service of your gospel and the expansion of your kingdom that the testimony of their faith in these days would stir those around them to ask, what is this hope that sustains you? So God, uphold them. Lord, you are righteous in all your ways and kind in all your works. You are near to all who call on you, who call on you in truth. And in that word, Lord, I am reminded of these five, these five dear brothers who profess their faith before us this morning. I pray for Gus and Lincoln, for Patch and Cole and Matthew. Lord, you have drawn them to yourself, called them by your name. You've opened their eyes to both the reality of their sin and your beauty. So, Lord, with what you have begun, because you are faithful in all of your words, because you are righteous in all your ways and kind in all your works, God, would you fulfill and complete what you have begun in them? All the way to the end. God, you preserve all who love you. But all the wicked you will destroy. And in that, Father, we thank you for your abundant mercy and patience. That you are still yet drawing sinners to yourself. So in this world of sin, we pray that you would grow your church, that you would bring many into that fold of those who love you and delight in you. And we do pray, Lord, come quickly, bring an end to evil. May your will be done on earth just exactly as it is in heaven. And now, Father, we ask that you would fill Pastor Kenny with your spirit as he preaches your word and fill us with your spirit that we might hear and obey your word, that together we might grow up into the fullness that is Christ. Father, we pray in his blessed and glorious name, our dear Savior, amen.
Our sermon text today is in the Gospel of Luke. It's Luke 10, 17 to 20. If you have the blue pew Bible, it's on page 868. Luke 10, 17 through 20. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. We continue this morning in our series through the Gospel of Luke. Last week, Matt Moore preached from the beginning of Luke 10, in which Jesus sent out 72 of his disciples to go ahead of him through the towns and villages on the way to Jerusalem as Jesus is heading to Jerusalem, where he'll be crucified. And uh, Matt called it the, the most important work in the world, this disciple-making, evangelizing work that the disciples were, were set out to do, and that, that's right. Jesus had given them the mission stated in Luke 10, 9, heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. The kingdom of God has come near to you. Why? Because Jesus, the king, has come. He's come. And Jesus prepared the 72 disciples that they would be rejected in some of the towns and villages. And when that happened, they were to shake the dust off their feet, warn the people of God's certain judgment. His fiery judgment upon them would be worse than that that came upon the wicked city of Sodom in Genesis 19, and they were to move on to the next town. So that was last week. And now our text is the return of the 72 disciples. They gathered around Jesus for like an after action mission report to tell Jesus how it had gone. And it had gone better than I think they could have expected. Verse 17, Lord, even the demons are subject to us. In your name. And I take that to mean even, Lord, we were successful. The, the, the mission was fruitful. People believed that Messiah had come. We, we healed sick in your name. And, and can, you, can you believe it? Even the demons obeyed us. They cast out demons. The, the very thing, remember a couple weeks ago, that the 12 disciples were unable to do in, in, in chapter 9, verse 40. So they were overjoyed, the 72, when they came back to Jesus. And yet, we read that Jesus has this word of correction for them. The disciples' joy, albeit about their fruitful part in the greatest work in the world is misplaced. Verse 20, Jesus says to them, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Well, Jesus has a word of correction here for the disciples, and I take it he has a word of correction for us. His aim is that you and I rejoice in and be most delighted in the fact that our names are written in heaven. 
Jesus is steering our hearts away from an idolatrous joy that finds our greatest joy in the successes and accomplishments of our lives, even when they're done in, even those things that are done in Jesus' name. And he's directing us towards the greatest, most satisfying, lasting, God-glorifying joy in the universe, namely our joy in him because our names are written in heaven. So let's pray and ask God to work in us by the power of this word and his spirit to align our hearts with the most deepest satisfying joy in the universe, namely the joy that's in him that is ours because our names as Christians have been written in the book, written in heaven. Father in heaven, I pray now that you would align our deepest joys with this teaching of Jesus here. Wean us from settling our joy in our own successes and accomplishments, even those successes and accomplishments done for you in Jesus' name. And rather, fix our deepest joy in what you have done for us, not in what we have done for you. Namely, you've written our names in heaven. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We've been chosen before the foundation of the world to be holy. We've been predestined for adoption to the praise of your glorious grace. We've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb and set free from bondage to sin. We've been forgiven all our trespasses because of Christ. And you've sealed us with your spirit, guaranteeing our, in her, in, our e eternal inheritance by which we cry, Abba, Father. So now sanctify us by this word of Christ to this end that we may know our greatest and most satisfying and lasting joy that is in you because you have written our names in heaven. Do this for the glory of your name and our joy now and for all eternity, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Luke has structured our text in, in a literary form called an inclusio. Let me just explain it. It's a structure used in different places in the Old and New Testament. Uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount is one long one, for instance. It's, it's a little like a sandwich. It's not a little like a sandwich. It's like a sandwich um, in which... The theme or themes in the beginning are echoed again at the end, and there's content in the middle. So let me put that over this text. The, the, the theme or themes in the beginning verse, verse 17, I think the main one is joy, also a reference to demons and Jesus' name are echoed again in verse 20 at the end. Main theme being said here is rejoice, joy, with the mention of spirits lining up with demons. And Jesus does a twist. He doesn't talk about his name. He talks about our names. So I'm seeing this as this, this sandwich, this inclusio where Jesus begins with joy in verse 17, or excuse me, the disciples begin with joy, verse 17. Jesus is gonna end with joy in verse 20. And in between verses 18 and 19, it's kind of like the peanut butter and jelly or the, the, the meat of the sandwich in between. And what he says in between there shapes the, the, the end of the inclusio, which really, is a twist on where the inclusio began. It changes the meaning of joy. 
So I hope that makes sense. That, that is my outline. It's the, this, this sandwich. The top slice is the great yet inferior joy of the disciples, verse 17. The meat in the middle is the authority of Jesus. That's what I'm calling it. In verses 18 and 19. And the bottom slice is the supreme eternal joy that Jesus is going to direct us to. And that's the main point. I mean, I said it's the bottom slice, it's the bottom line of the teaching. So let's look at that. Three points. Top slice, the meat in the middle, and the bottom slice, the bottom line. Number one, the, bo- the top slice. The, a great yet inferior joy, verse 17. As you likely know, uh, every evangelistic effort or short-term mission trip, trip does not end in resounding success, does it? Every time you go share the gospel with someone, ha! People don't always believe. And uh, boy, we have missionaries that go to the hard places and they will labor for 30 years and see very little fruit. It doesn't always go this way. But here in this one, the 72 return with great joy. Lord, even the demons are subject to, your, to us in your name. And who wouldn't rejoice? I mean, who wouldn't be happy with the, that kind of fruitful ministry? You know, the 72 went out in faith to do what Jesus told them to do, to proclaim the gospel, to, to, to display the power of Christ. People believed, they were healed, demons were cast out, people were set free. Even unbelievers were put on notice of God's judgment. It was a success. Why shouldn't they be happy? I mean, we just celebrated five baptisms. And, and, and Billy, Billy Corr, standing right down there in Ken Curry, why shouldn't they be happy? Luke 15, Jesus says, look, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So I, I say, this is a great joy, but it's an inferior joy that Jesus is going to point it going to expose it to be. It's a great joy. Aren't we supposed to rejoice in the gospel going forth? It would seem wrong not to rejoice. But Jesus' concern here and his correction zeroes in not merely on the disciples' joy in the saving power of Christ, but in their delight in being the means to it. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. How how do you feel when your labors are successful and fruitful? More to the point, how do you feel when God works through you (laughs) to great effect? You spoke the gospel and a friend or your child believed. You prayed for healing for a a, a sick loved one and God answered and they were healed. You encouraged a despairing sister in Christ and God granted hope in her heart. You went to a brother to point out his sin and he listened and he repented and came back to thank you. You taught a class, or you led your small group, or you loved the needy. God was glorified in your labors and in your ministry. Or you preached a sermon and some people were helped. Or right out of this text, you rebuked the demonic powers and they scattered. How might you feel? Effective, significant, happy, satisfied. That's point number one. Point number two, I'm calling this the meat in the middle. And my title on it is my 
knitting together of these two verses, what's Jesus getting at? What he's getting at, as I see it, is Messiah has come. The kingdom has come. The kingdom has been inaugurated. Remember the transfiguration. You want to see the kingdom? Jesus shining like the sun. Messiah has come. This is the meat. Jesus, the messianic king, has come to inaugurate the kingdom of God. And his arrival marks the beginning of the promised age to come when God brings eternal salvation to all his people and he brings final justice and judgment to all his enemies. Because Jesus is this messianic king, the messianic king, two things are gloriously true in regard to the evil power of Satan over this world. Number one, verse 18, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Hmm. What's he getting at? Isaiah 14 contains this boastful description of Satan. When he says, Satan says, Isaiah 14, 13, I will send to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. And then in Luke 4, when Jesus is tempted, Satan himself exaggeratedly claims that he has all authority over all the kingdoms of the world. Luke 4, 5, and he offered all this to Jesus, remember? If only Jesus would worship Satan. And Jesus responded, quoting the scriptures, you shall worship the Lord your God and him alone will you serve. So in verse verse 18 here, Jesus is saying this, as lightning is sudden and takes place in a flash, so also the time of the tyranny of Satan has come to an end with the arrival of the Christ, Jesus himself, inaugurating the kingdom of God. And even the success of the disciples' mission in preaching and healing and authority over the demonic is evidence that the kingdom has come. The kingdom of God has been inaugurated with the arrival of Jesus. And it will be consummated when Jesus comes again at the end of the age, but it has begun. Second point I see here about Messiah having come. Jesus says in verse 19 that he has delegated his authority to his disciples, 19. Behold, or look, I always like to translate behold, look, look. I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Jesus states, this is, this is in the perfect tense. I've given you authority. I've already given it to you and it continues for the work of gospel advance. And Satan's serpents and scorpions and schemes are no match for my authority. Nothing that the devil can throw at you or God's people will harm you. I mean, Jesus says it. My mind went right to Luke 12. I'll tell you why, because I mean, I've said this before. A week does not go by that I don't get emails from a couple of different sources about Christians being killed all over the world for their faith. Jesus, what do you mean nothing will hurt you? Luke 12, we'll get there in a couple months, I suppose. Luke 12, four, Jesus says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who can kill the body 
and after that have nothing more that they can do. In other words, I'm going to link it to our text. Your names are written in the book. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. The worst thing that they can do is kill you. That won't harm you at all. That's the middle. So the top of the sandwich, the top of the inclusio, the misplaced, the good but misplaced joy of the disciples, the middle, Christ has come. Good job. Number three, the bottom slice, a supreme and eternal joy. This is the point. I mean, I don't know how it hit you, but did it surprise you when you hit verse 20 in the reading? The disciples are rejoicing, and Jesus is, he does the middle, and then he says, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. What's he getting at? I'll tell you what he's getting at. The Bible's clear that every person who has ever lived, ever, will stand before Christ to face God's judgment for how we lived. And the names of all those who have been redeemed by Christ will be found to have been written, quote, written before the foundation of the world in the book of life, in the book of the life of the lamb who was slain, Revelation 13, 7. And they, and they alone, will be saved from the wrath of God and welcomed into his eternal kingdom and experience pleasures forevermore. And joy, eternal. On the other hand, Revelation 20, 15 says this. If anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Eternal punishment. So you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying to the successful, joyful disciples celebrating their ministry, success. He's saying, brothers, do not rejoice that the demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your names have been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the lamb who was slain for your salvation. Rejoice fair. Make that your greatest joy. He's teaching us that the joy of our salvation is the greatest, is the most satisfying, is the most lasting. It is the joy that is in God himself, being reconciled to God in Christ forever. Your deepest joy must not be in your successes or in your effectiveness in anything, not even in ministry. Elsewhere, Jesus warns. Hey, I mean, you know, if you think about this. Hey, we spoke in Jesus' name. He's, this, is, this is it. I mean, Jesus warns, this is Matthew 7, 21. It's not eternally significant that God does wondrous things through you. I'll tell you how Jesus said it. One, a line from Spurgeon's coming in my mind right now. He says, reflecting on Balaam's donkey, he says, God can speak through donkeys. It's not about you. <laughs> anyway, here's what Jesus says. 
This is sobering. Matthew 7, 21. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not, here's the list, prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Your names are not written in heaven. So Jesus is orienting us and the disciples to rest our joy in the grace of God that he knows us. He redeemed us. He has removed his wrath wrath from us. He has written our names in the book before the foundation of the world. All those who are in Christ. Make that your highest joy. I wonder if you feel the consistency of Jesus in in this this teaching over the last couple chapters in chapters 9 and 10. I guess it's mostly 9. Jesus is teaching us and the disciples, if you're a true disciple, if, if if you're really one who treasures me, you will love me. You'll treasure me more than your own life. Take up your cross and follow me. 9.24. More than the whole world. Give up the whole world in favor of Jesus. 9.25. More than your status or position. 9.48. Remember the disciples arguing over that. More than home. 9.58, more than family obligations, 9.59, more than family affections, 9.61. In fact, Jesus would say, if any of these things, your own life, the whole world, status, home, family obligations, family affections, fruitfulness in ministry, has supremacy over Christ and your salvation, you don't know him. Or at least you need this word of correction to align your heart to rejoice in your salvation over God's good gifts. He loves us. Jesus loves us too much to let us settle for misplaced, inferior, often idolatrous joys. I have a couple illustrations that I'll close with. When we, when we interview prospective elders or prospective leaders, uh, when I've interviewed prospective church planters, we often probe their understanding of the kind of thing that Jesus is talking about that I would call Christian hedonism. We call it Christian hedonism that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied, most joyful in him. And when we meet with these prospective leaders, we're trying to discern if they if they get this, that Jesus, what Jesus is talking about here. And uh, so I'll ask a question. It's not a trick question, really. I'm not trying to trap anybody. We probe into this, but trying to discern. If, does, this, does this person know that the most satisfying joy in the universe, in the Christian life, is the joy in knowing God through Christ, the joy of our salvation? Do they know this? And I can't tell you how many times I've heard prospective applicants say things like this. Oh, I love Christian hedonism. I find my greatest joy in Bible reading. I find that I'm most satisfied in obedience to God. 
I find my satisfaction in serving others with my gifts. Or I find my joy in teaching. Or I find my greatest delight in being in corporate worship. Or I find my greatest joy when I share the gospel with another. And at that point, it becomes a teaching moment when I have to say something like this. It's, well, that's not quite it. That's not quite what we're talking about. We're talking about delight yourself in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Talking about God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him, when we're most delighted in him. The main point, the high point of our joy is not our ministry, our teaching, our preaching, our serving, or our being in small group or worship. Our highest joy is not in spreading the gospel or opposing the works of Satan. Those can be means to our enjoyment of God, but they themselves are not it. Again, Jesus loves us too much to settle for means when we can settle, we, he, not settle, when we can enjoy himself and God. So that's one, one illustration. May your joy in the Lord settle, rest, terminate, find its supreme expression in joy in God himself. Rejoicing that your names are written in heaven. You're saved and reconciled to God to enjoy him forever. Here's the last illustration. This is, this is uh, from Martin Lloyd-Jones. He, this is kind of a, I mean, if you, maybe if you read any of the Puritans or you know some of these influential pastors of the 20th century. Martin Lloyd-Jones is one of them. He's, he pastored in London for almost 30 years at Westminster Chapel. Ian, Mo Ian Murray wrote his biography, and he tells a story of going to see Martin Lloyd-Jones about six months before he died. He, he knew he was, he was very ill, and um, he had stepped out of the ministry, so preaching for 30, you know, almost 30 years, and now he's He's homebound. Ian Murray says this. Quote, when I arrived in his room, he had a text. <laughs> it was for me. <laughs> it was a text for me. Uh, a text that he had obviously been preaching to himself. And it was our text. Luke 10, 17. The 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus replied, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And Murray goes on to say, The lesson of the text, he said, is that we are, if we are living upon what we do, if our happiness is based upon our preaching or our service for Christ, there is something deeply wrong with it. Not in this, says our Lord, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Murray goes on. The ultimate test of a preacher is what he feels like when he cannot preach. He's quoting from his conversation with Lloyd-Jones. It is a real snare for the preacher to live upon preaching. Plug in whatever your ministry is. People say to me now, this is Lloyd-Jones talking, it must be very sad for you not to be able to preach. Can you imagine 30 some years of preaching, sitting at home for, I don't know how long, at least six months more probably, years, not being able to minister. It must be very sad for you not to be able to preach. 
Lloyd-Jones replies, not at all. I was not living upon my preaching. I was living upon, I'm adding this, the fact that my name is written in heaven. Father in heaven, grant us grace now to align our joys with the ultimate, our joy in you. Make all the other joys of life and ministry and family fall aligned underneath the joy of our salvation, we pray. So, I pray that you'd be glorified in us by our being satisfied, being happy, being delighted in you. Most of all, ultimately, over all things. May it be true when ministry goes well. May it be true when it doesn't. May it be true when family life goes well, even when it doesn't. And may it be true even on our deathbed, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. You can stand.
in this week's pastor's letter, I'll send, I'll include a link to Pastor John Piper's uh, message, a, a sermon, a little sermon he gave on this same text in which he closes with seven results, seven impacts that this text, rejoicing in our salvation overall, has in our lives. So I'll send you that, that link. And uh, remember now, next week is Palm Sunday. How about that? And uh, I got to give you a preview of our text. Jesus is, is going to rejoice. It's, it's really linked to this passage that we had today. Jesus rejoices in the Holy Spirit to God the Father for God's sovereignty in salvation. So that's where we're going on Palm Sunday. And Easter service schedule is the same as normal, normal so nothing tricky. 9 and 11. And I hope you plan to join us for Monday, Thursday. So... May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming.